All right, very good. Our next speaker for this afternoon is Nicholas Payan and Zunza, um, who's joined us this summer from UCLA. Nicholas has been working with Anna, and uh, he'll tell us today about their project together using stellar streams to probe the shape of the Milky Way's dark matter halo. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. So um, today I will be going through my presentation and I will be going through the topics in this order. First, I will give some motivation for the project um, and explaining some background information. Uh, I will then show why stellar streams are ideal candidates in the study of dark matter. Um, I will go over the methods of analysis, uh, some results from that analysis, and then future work concluding there. So uh, let us define dark matter. Dark matter is this uh, mysterious quantity of mass that interacts solely gravitationally with the things around it. Um, here we have a graph of rotation curves versus uh, the, the rotational velocity of objects in the galaxy against the galactocentric distance. And so you see here that um, given that uh, circular velocities can be predicted by um, mass, uh, a, a mass distribution, the mass distribution of the observed light in the galaxy can't explain the entirety of what we observe. So what we do is we sprinkle in some magic and uh, you know this mysterious force called dark matter uh, gives us the necessary uh, results. By the way, that was a joke. Dark matter is real and uh, science is real. So what does this dark matter actually look like? To give a picture in your mind, it looks like this. Uh, this is the um, NFW model, the most popular model today, developed empirically in the 90s by uh, Navarro, Frank, and White, called the NFW model. Um, it's spherically symmetric uh, radial density profile, uh, which is characterized by some mass and some radius. So uh, these are the parameters for the Milky Way. And you can see that a majority of the mass is contained within this characteristic radius. But can we do better? Does the NFW halo explain the full picture? The thing about NFW is that it doesn't actually tell us anything about dark matter itself. It's just a nice static distribution that we can insert into simulations uh, so we don't have to do the hard work of computing dark matter particles and uh, all the dynamics there. Um, so it, it doesn't actually tell us anything about it, dark matter's origins. Um, it, it, it's just uh, nice to use. So. Can we get a fuller picture? Um, here, uh, there have been observational clues to indicate that NFW um, isn't the full picture and that we might actually have some sort of asymmetry in the global distribution of dark matter uh, rather than uh, spherically symmetric. So here we have uh, Gaia sausage Enceladus. Um, uh, it's a collection of stars uh, that are believed to originate from a merger between a dwarf galaxy and a young Milky Way uh, some eight to 10 billion years ago. And it has a noticeable tilt with respect to the galactic plane. Now, if it were to have originated that long ago, uh, it could not have survived in a spherical halo. This is a study from uh, Han. And what they showed in this paper is that taking initial conditions five billion years ago uh, and putting it into a spherical halo resulted in uh, tilted structure loss over just one giga year. Um, whereas in a tilted halo, uh, we have the we have that we um, maintain this tilted structure. So this motivates us to study whether we can constrain the tilt if there is one. So what is a stellar stream and how can that help us constrain this tilt? Uh, stellar streams originate from globular clusters or dwarf galaxies. Um, I'll just focus on the globular cluster origins for now. Um, what, uh, what happens is that inside a globular cluster, stars will gravitationally scatter off of each other until they reach escape velocity being flung out of the cluster. From there, they will go, um, ran being that they are randomly ejected, they will fall either in towards the center or outwards from the center. And that will lead the stars to trail ahead or behind in the orbit of the cluster creating this long, thin structure that we see in the sky. Uh, so here I'm about to show you a very cool movie. Um, what I have is 
the equipotential contours of the halo that I am simulating these streams in. You take the initial conditions of a globular cluster, plug it into a simulation, and it will create the stream for you given a certain uh, mass distribution in a galaxy. So let's see what happens when we change the distribution. So here we squish the dark matter halo down. And then here we rotate it. And you can visibly see that the orbit and the stream shapes change. And then we compare it to what we originally had. Um, it's somewhat difficult to see, but uh, the orbits are certainly very different. And you can see in the streams that they sort of fan out in different directions at the ends. Um, the reason that they're sort of similar in the middle is that we use the same initial conditions for both of them being that they end up at the globular cluster core. So now that you've seen how we can use streams to detect changes in dark matter, what we will do is simulate these streams and compare them to observation and see which models best fit the observed uh, um, stream paths. So what we have here is a stream. Uh, this is a stream catalog from, uh, it's called Gal Streams. Here are the plots in the sky, and these are the six streams we are looking at. The reason we look at these ones is because they are well studied and have known globular cluster core progenitors. Uh, so they're easy to simulate. Um, and this is what they look like in the sky. Now, when we simulate each of them under a Milky Way disk with an NFW halo, we see that for some streams it is well fit, especially for this one right here. Uh, but for other ones, we don't see the full picture solely by using the NFW halo. So now this brings us to how we um, actually compare the streams to observation. Uh, first, we do a coordinate shift, but don't worry about that. It's just it's still sky coordinates. And here we can see up close what each uh, model gives us versus the observation. Um, here in yellow, we have the stream in the tilted uh, dark matter distribution. Here in magenta, we have the stream in the ordinary spherically symmetric dark matter distribution. And you can see that the tails sort of turn up in different directions. Uh, and uh, to be quite honest, neither of them compares that well to observation. Um, but can we quantify that? The answer is yes. Uh, here we have um, interpolations. So what we do is we just take a straight line and cut it directly through the middle of the stream, which is what you do qualitatively by eye but this allows us to assign numbers to how well the stream fits the data. Um, we do that using chi-squared. So you simply take your model, compare it to the data, and normalize by um, standard deviation. So that tells us how significantly different any point on this interpolated graph is, uh, how significantly different it is from observation. Uh, it's basically, if you want to think about it, the sum of the z-score squared. So the greater your chi-squared value for a given model, that means the worse, uh, sorry, that means that um, it does not explain the model, so the, the observations as well as something with a lower chi-squared. Um, and you can see in the residuals that our interpolations are pretty good because there's no clear trend. Uh, now, um, here we actually have our numerical analysis. This is our example. Um, in each uh, phase space coordinate, so that just means you know sky coordinates plus the proper motions, um, we calculate the chi squared for the uh, for the ordinary dark matter distribution and then the tilted asymmetric one, and we see that our uh, tilted model does better in two of the phase space coordinates, but not in the third. However, the total, which is what matters by the end, actually does do better. And the beautiful thing about this is that I chose this model at random. This actually has nothing to do with the priors. I was just tinkering with the, with, with, with the simulations. If you saw me squishing and tilting the halo, that was quite literally me just messing around. So, and so this shows that we can actually do much better than the NFW halo. And it further motivates our search for uh, asymmetries in the dark matter distribution. So in the future, what we plan to do is do this. So, so far, you just saw this stream, NGC 7089. Uh, we plan to do this for all six of the streams that uh, we have um, looked at at the same time. So you sum the chi-squared for each of these streams and each of their coordinates all at the same time, and then minimize that chi-squared quantity, uh, You know, um, minimize these significant differences 
uh, in order to obtain the best fit parameters. So in summary, uh, stellar streams are good at detecting changes in the dark matter distribution. Uh, what we will do is then simulate streams in different dark matter distributions and compare them to observation. And we will see which streams, um, which dark matter distribution produces the best fit for each of the streams. And that will allow us to constrain um, how much the dark matter halo might actually be tilted with respect to the galactic plane. Uh, thank you. Amazing work. In your simulations, do you use a static halo or an evolving one? Static. OK. Um, yes, yeah, static halo, but there's theoretically nothing stopping us from using a dynamic one. Um, and the other interesting thing is that uh, in, if I go way back here, this end body simulation, which was taken from a different paper than Han, it was taken from Naidu. Um, actually does use a dynamically evolving dark matter distribution. They simulate the dark matter particles in an end body simulation. Um, so there's, uh, there's nothing stopping us from using a dynamic simulation and it could be useful. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Cool presentation. Thanks. Um, so you showed these movies of kind of what happens to the set of initial conditions as you change the tilt and the squish and all the all the parameters of this thing. And I noticed in one of them, it looked like your cluster got completely blown up and disrupted. Is that just an artifact of that particular combination of initial conditions and halo parameters? Does this happen in real life? Should we go look for blown up clusters? The answer is yes, it is due to the initial conditions. and. Uh, yes, it does happen. Well, at least it should. Um, if you look, it has this particular globular cluster has an extremely tiny pericenter. Um, and mm -hmm. I'll just play it again. But once the orbit actually gets further from, uh, once the pericenter gets larger, it becomes more streamlined. Mm -hmm. You see, so the width is correlated with the pericenter of the orbit, which is extremely interesting. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Thank you.